Uh, hi, welcome to what is usually known as politics for people who hate politics. Today it's a little more like uh, aliens for people who hate aliens. <laughs> Love aliens? No, I don't know. It's one of those things where I no longer know what the, um, the, the, the real title of the show is because our topic is very, very strange and very, very not skeptical. So we do have Dan Beer of the Skeptical Libertarian <laughs> on. He is the official uh, fun ruiner for this talk about aliens. Uh, I mean, it even says so right there under his name. Aliens, etc., let's call it. Um, we have Meg Gilliland whose name I struggle with, much like I struggle with Andrew Carell's. There's like a certain thing about the continent, so I just have to like struggle. Um, I'm sorry, my love for Meg is deep though and true. <laughs> we also have uh, Seth Wilson, who sometimes writes things at Cult Western, um, and we like him. He has strong feelings about Sasquatch. Yeah. We oh. have <laughs> Zach Fontaine, who does musical things um, and has a song about an alien, if I recall. Do you have a song about an alien? You do. I do. And I have a song about UFOs, but it's more of a love song. Good. But... We're going to link to that when, I, when we post this. It's going to be All good. right. And we have, who is probably the catalyst um, for this podcast topic, Todd Seavey. Hi there. Who is a skeptic, but has fallen deep into the rabbit hole of no. aliens lately. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's not, we're not undermining his credibility because it means he's fun, and that's what we like. All right. People who are not fun is my brother Joe, who is such a basic bitch that he had to go to the gym instead of talking about aliens with us. <laughs> that is rough. Um, it's, I don't even know what to do with that. I don't know where to begin. Um, I want to start off with something basic, which I guess is, what's your favorite <clears throat> thing that doesn't probably exist, but that's not fun anyway? I love the Mothman. As my, I'm just going to do this. Frame from hooting and hollering this time, Todd. It's my beautiful Mothman shirt. When I was 15, I went to Point Pleasant, West Virginia to go to Mothman Fest, which is just as weird Americana-y and like, awkward and great as it sounds. Um, I highly recommend it. It continues to this day every year in Point Pleasant, um, West Virginia. So that's good. I love the Mothman. Um, Seth, what, what, what manner of creature do you like that probably doesn't exist, but that's not fun? Oh, me? Yeah, share with the class. I said that Steph, and I was like, there's no Steph in this group. Uh, <laughs> I do know your name. I well, I you. just shot this down right off the gate. Um, I like the Sasquatch. I think he's awesome. Um, and I think I think if you kill Sasquatch to prove he exists, then we should be allowed to kill you to prove that you exist. Wow, that's heavy. I mean, you shouldn't kill Sasquatch. Just don't kill Sasquatch, and we'll leave you alone. <laughs> Um, all right, let's do, um, Zach, what creature has captured your heart or entity? I mean, it's it's we'll keep it loose. <laughs> you know, uh, I was like chupacabras. You know, I mm -hmm. thought maybe you know Very I'd life. have one. Yeah, yeah. I thought you know maybe I'd like tame one, have it as a pet or um, as a friend someday. Um, yeah, you know, it's 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 tough picking a favorite, but uh, I like those aliens, of course. Can't go wrong. But they exist. <laughs> well, that's true. Spoiler well, that's another. That's maybe the next question, Meg. <laughs> Meg, what, what's your favorite creature, Meg, or entity? Um, so, well, I mean, I would go with aliens, except, as I just mentioned, they do exist. Um, <laughs> All right. <we'll> <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, I, I would actually, I would have to go with Mothman as well, and I did not know about this beautiful festival. <laughs> Oh, it's so How good. How did I not know? <laughs> they should have told you, Meg. They, they should have. Told have. You. Mothman should have come and told me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm actually um, super excited to go to this strange, strange festival. <laughs> we should, we should go. We're going to. It's, it's absolutely happening. I also really... dates have not been announced yet, but. <laughs> I saw. I was like refreshing the website. For <laughs> I would, five days. would literally be the happiest moment of my life if we all just went to Mothman Fest, and then Dan could come along and just ruin everything, and it would be great. And, there, and there's a museum. There's a museum too. Like we could go to the museum at any time. It's it's open like all the time. I don't. It was it was not open yet when I went there. It was a bit more primitive in my day. Um, Todd, what about you? Are you just oh. gonna go with aliens, or you can opine on another favorite mm -hmm. if you have one? Well, I just say briefly after uh, 
uh, 30 years of being uh, a hardcore skeptic um, who doesn't believe in God, ghosts, psychic powers, uh, you know, uh, horoscopes, uh, you know, telekinesis, any of it. Um, I, you know, I always thought, like, uh, if there are any uh, UFOs of interest, why aren't there, why is it always like you know one bumpkin out in the middle of nowhere? Why right. aren't there why aren't there convincing cases where there are multiple independent witnesses? Uh, and the thing is not only seen visually, but tracked on radar, preferably mm. by multiple radars. And it turns out there are countless such cases. Uh, and in fact, multiple governments have been terrified about what that means for about 70 years. And multiple governments have come to the conclusion that something is going on. Uh, and ours is really the only government that has double-talked about it and said half the time there's nothing to it, it's all just misperception and the other half of the time has secretly, desperately tried to figure out what they are. That doesn't make them aliens. Now could we're be, getting somewhere, Todd. Thank could you. Be, could be weird meteorological <laughs> phenomena, could, could be military, uh, could all still be misperception, but it's much more complicated and much more convincing uh, than I ever would have guessed as a casual skeptic, for th and not even a casual skeptic, a guy who's written for Skeptical Inquirer and things like that uh, for 30 years. I never would have imagined that there was as strong a case for the UFOs as there is, whereas I would say there is no case for any other paranormal or conspiracy oh. phenomena I know of. <laughs> much as I, much, oh. as I <laughs> much as I would have, if, if, uh, <clears throat> if you would ask me to bet which one was most plausible like 20 years ago, mm -hmm. I probably would have bet on Bigfoot only because, not, not, mm -hmm. not because... Seth, I think this, this one's for you. Not because I think there's any good evidence for him, but rather because that would probably require the least adjustment to the way we see the world. Uh, in other words, if you found out there were psychic powers, that changes physics and stuff. If you found out there's just a big ape in North America, you'd be like, oh, we got an ape. That's interesting. Right. Uh, but we probably don't have an ape. Or I mean, the Yeti, though, which is probably even more probable. And Sir Evan Hillary went to look for it and found nothing. But at yeah. least he bothered to look. I mean, <laughs> and, and crucially, Spike TV offered, you know, $10 million for finding Bigfoot, and still nobody found it. So by the basic principles of Austrian economics, I think we can, you know, we can pretty much write <laughs> off Bigfoot now. Um, I what Todd said. I heard something interesting the other day on a, on a podcast that, that the, we put so, the government put so much time and attention into trying to figure out what exactly is going on with UFOs. We said, like, what if what's going on is so scary that and the CIA knows about it, that selling crack to kids and, like, assassinating, like, priests is actually the next best option. Like, oh, God! Is <laughs> the most terrifying thing you can think of? It is! Like, it's one of those things where, like, my spine crinkled. I was like, that's crazy. I don't believe that. My spine was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. yeah, so that's not good. Um, well, and by the way, just uh, one quick example out of far too many that are now burned into my brain oh, please, of, please, of, of how much interest the government has taken in all this over the years. And of course, probably none of us in this conversation think that government taking an interest in it makes it a legit topic. But uh, the first director of the CIA, who happened to be director during the Roswell incident, whatever that was, right? Uh, he officially... Uh, chastised Congress for publicly for not looking into UFOs more and claimed the Air Force was concealing extraterrestrials. First director of the CIA. Uh, and, you know, maybe he was maybe he was joking. I don't know, but he said it. He actually sent a formal letter to Congress and said, we have to, we have to tell the Air Force to stop covering this up. It's really important. I don't know. You'd think the CIA ought to be in a position to know. So I want to tell you guys. Oh, we should. Dan needs to ruin some. Uh, some of the things Todd said, probably. But like, okay, I read this book um, about Area 51 uh, two years ago, and it seemed like you know, like a legitimate book about it. Like Area 51 is a real place. It's full of real secrets. Like we know this, right? It was. Um, you know, it was it, it was uh, not officially admitted to exist until the 90s. We know it's an air base. It's not made up out of whole cloth. And the whole and like and, and I was hoping for kind of a, like a meta history where it was like you know the the stories about aliens started you know in this year and all that sort of thing, and I read the whole thing and it seemed very credible like a real history book, until the final chapter where the woman uses her interview with an unnamed supposed former employee of the of um 
I'm <clears throat> totally blanking on the error. Well, the, the, the point is that the explanation for Roswell was Joseph Mengele made hideous child hybrid creatures and they piloted a um, aircraft that Stalin sent and the entire purpose was like a you know a sort like a meta sort of like scaring the US type thing like it was honestly it was the one explanation you could find that was sounded more ridiculous than actual aliens <laughs> and i read this book and i was like what the hell is this I thought I was reading a, like a history book. And so you don't she, believe that theory? No, she actually <laughs> didn't even write like, okay, this guy who you know professed to work there told me this ridiculous story. Look how crazy it is. Like here it is. That would have been okay. She just wrote it down like, well, we've got it, guys. That's it. Right. So sometimes <laughs> things are more ridiculous than aliens. One one interesting thing that reminds me of is that uh, I think uh, all skeptics in the sense of participation in the so-called skeptics movement would agree that the gold standard as it were is when you've actually got like laboratory evidence, physical evidence, empirical evidence uh, but it's interesting that uh, as journalists as I, I think everybody here is uh, you know that uh, a lot of times you have to draw conclusions from what I guess you could loosely call journalistic rather than scientific evidence mm -hmm. In the sense that uh, if, if it's a question not like what's the melting point of gold, but is Russia planning to invade more of Ukraine, a lot of times that's going to be based on bits and pieces of data. Uh, so <clears throat> I knew uh, for years as a young skeptic that none of these UFO believers seemed to have any you know, laboratory evidence or convincing physical samples. Um, it's interesting how good a job some of them have done in the journalistic sense of tracking down through Freedom of Information Act requests and stuff uh, the, the documents revealing the government's great interest in this topic and there are a couple of guys named Kerry and Schmidt uh, who wrote a book called Witness to Roswell they're not as skeptical as they should be mm -hmm. but it is kind of hilarious if you if you sort of sympathize with zealots and obsessives how much genuine journalistic effort they went into to track down every living person uh, who could still be around who would have been a witness to events back in Roswell at the time and none of it proves there were aliens there but it right. does prove that everybody in town thought or like uh, most of the people in town thought there were while it was going on including the military base commanders who in some cases left affidavits that were supposed to be revealed only after their deaths saying I acted on the belief we were dealing with wreckage from an alien spaceship and believe that uh, though I did not see them with my own eyes uh, we were dealing with the disposal of alien bodies at the request of the Pentagon and so forth Oh no! The, the whole town I mean it could just show how rumors are run amok in a small town but the whole town which was filled with military uh, officials because it's right next to a military base it wasn't just a bunch of farmers and yokels in the sticks basically thought they were dealing with a crashed alien saucer, which is what the first military press release claimed after all, and within a day they backpedaled and said, no, it was a weather balloon, and 50 years later said, we lied about the weather balloon, it was actually a very special spy balloon with a big disc-shaped uh, sonar detector attached to it. I mean, isn't that the most credible explanation, and the fact that yeah. eyewitnesses suck, and the military, military yeah. personnel aren't magically... I mean, they're not scientists. They're not necessarily oh, yeah. much credible. Dan? By the way, if I don't see my face, does that mean I'm not cropping up? Oh, you're up? here. You're oh, here. okay. You're not. Um, the likelihood of aliens in, like, a real, like, grown-up and sort of disappointing way, but also comforting because I was really scared of aliens when I was a child. Aw. The possibility of aliens seems unlikely, and we seem to be lacking proof. Um, well, well, I mean, the probability that alien life exists somewhere in the universe is we don't have any idea because we don't actually have any data whether it's likely or not that there are other aliens. But, it, but to imagine that the Earth is the only place that has life, you have to imagine that whatever happened here is the only thing in trillions of stars and hundreds of billions of galaxies in 13.7 billion years to have ever happened. That's like mm -hmm. the most unlikely thing that's ever happened. And I don't think any of the explanations for the origin of life on Earth suggest that it's that unlikely. So I think there, there are probably other, you know, life forms out there, other civilizations, but 
I think it's a big, it's very interesting that we only start talking about aliens once our own race is out now actually able to travel into space. And we start thinking about other planets. And then all of these, you know, UFO reports, like, you know, we, we know that there are other things that exist, like airplanes and weather balloons and swamp gas and whatever else you want to, and hallucinations. I mean, like 90% of the UFO reports in New Jersey are, I swear to God, the result of people getting drunk outside the Air Force Base uh, in the woods out there. Uh, I know, because, you know, I've done that. So, <laughs> and did you say aliens? I mean, I, we know that alcohol is a thing that exists, and we know that people are not reliable witnesses. And so I think it would just be a big coincidence. Like, I'm not saying that aliens couldn't visit Earth. Like, we don't know about the possible technology of traveling between stars or whatever. But... It would be amazing if they came to Earth just now. Like, the Earth is like four and a half billion years old. Like, isn't it more likely that sometime in the last four and a half billion years they came here and it was a barren rock and there was nothing interesting? <laughs> and then they just, they're like, oh, this sucks. And then they left. <laughs> That's, no, no. Dan, I just I really feel like you've never watched Ancient Aliens. You it's a great Oh my god. No, I have watched the Ancient, the ancient Astronauts. Wait, so that mean ancient astronaut aliens? theorists believe that Dan is a jerk. No, we know we know what happened. <laughs> aliens came here millions of years ago and they imprisoned Tom Cruise in a little box <laughs> you know, and then they they left and then the volcano exploded. And then Tom Cruise made cocktail. <laughs> is that the, the, the basic timeline? Is that <laughs> yes. yes. That's, That's more plausible, plausible to me. That's more <laughs> plausible. I, would, I will say, of course, I uh, I share Dan's uh, desire to use. Uh, Occam's razor to come up with the simplest possible explanation. Um, uh, it is interesting, though, I, I think just as sort of a limbering mental exercise for skeptics to ask, our, ask ourselves whether we might be drawn to simple explanations without having much more evidence for them than for the crazy explanations the believers love. But so, for example... You don't have to prove... I mean, you don't have to prove that aliens don't exist. You have to prove they do exist. I mean, that's... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, but sometimes uh, we're right. But uh, skeptics, having dismissed the say the the paranormal explanation, uh, will sometimes light upon an alternative explanation. Almost. Oops! Mother of God! <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> I have failed right, so everything. You muted Todd, so I'm just going to jump in here and say. Yeah, please that. do. That was my uh, keyboard being angry. Sorry, Todd. Oh, all right. Okay, well, since you've still muted him, <laughs> the, I mean, like, most, most even UFO believers will say that, like, 90% of the sightings are crap. They're just, their evidence is bad. They're not good. But there's, like, a few cases that are, like, you know, much more compelling, that there's something, something else going on here that's not explained like the other 99% of cases are. And I right. just think that that's not... I just think that that's not particularly likely. I mean, like, what are the odds that, like, we know people fabricate things and make up stories and, you know, misinterpret things? Like, what are the... Like, and the fact that the government is interested in this is just proof that the government is composed of the same idiots that everyone else is. And people <laughs> who are paranoid about... Yeah, I mean, people who are parent like fucking Dennis Kucinich thinks he he saw an alien spacecraft. Right, fucking, he's fucking Dennis Kucinich. That's not a reliable eyewitness in my. That was Jimmy Carter. Um, so that your uh, your argument's starting to uh, win me over. Uh, well, plus, like people, I think people are gonna see that stuff if they look for it. I mean, I I love like looking at the stars and looking like in a dark sky, and I see like weird stuff move around and like zip around in ways that are, you know, that are different than, like, you know, seeing a plane or anything, but I think it's whether you see that and think, oh, that looks neat, or whether you, you know, are obsessed with finding a UFO and thinks that think that's what it is, so. No. So I think there's definitely a lot of bias in the, you know, in the eyewitness well, sense. Well, I mean, like, here's, here's the problem, which is that if you want to say that a new species exists, you have to have a type specimen. You have to have a body. 
And you can say that the government is covering it up and, you know, Bigfoots are really scarce or aliens are like their bodies evaporate when they die or something. But that's just a special pleading. Like, at some point you actually have to have a crashed spaceship and a dead body and saying, look, this is a new species and here's the proof and here's the evidence. And I think that the fact that Actually, I, we've I never really, had that. Means I, I, that I think in a philosophical sense, that is not an accurate understanding of how skepticism works. And one of the reasons I wish skeptics would uh, talk about this more is that I don't think they've thought through their epistemology as carefully as they think they have. So, for instance, they, they'll have a tendency to say, we can't say aliens exist as long as there's some other more down-to-earth explanation like ball lightning. But there's not that much evidence for ball lightning. There's more evidence for aliens than there is for ball lightning in some important sense. So at some point, you do have to ask, how much subjective wiggle room have the skeptics left themselves to pick the explanations they find more comforting because they're not as weird? Uh, so you can't just make stuff up like, oh, I think it was the Intergalactic Federation and there, and, you know, and there are ghosts and so forth. But just because you can, you can think of some uh, uh, earthly explanation doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's all that plausible. Just to give one example, uh, for the giant silent hovering triangles, that have been seen with great frequency by multiple witnesses and tracked on radar all over the Earth. Uh, the official British Ministry of Defense explanation at one point, this is the best they could come up with, was maybe there are spontaneously occurring electrical balls of plasma that tend to uh, shape themselves into geometric patterns like triangles and then hover uh, in relation to Earth's magnetic field without moving at all and induce hallucinations because of their electromagnetic field that cause people to think they saw other details of the craft, such as metal and so forth. That was like their official explanation. And again, I'm not saying all skeptics endorse that, but it's a reminder of how in the desperation to come up with a less weird explanation, you can, you can turn into a crank, which is different from, a, uh, from like an outright uh, believer, uh, in that you, you keep trying to desperately to come up with uh, some simpler explanation that may without you realizing it, be more complicated uh, than, than the most obvious one. Um, so, uh, I don't know. For, sure, sure, but I just don't think that aliens are intergalactic, you know, travelers from space who are very cagey about ever being seen or photographed or, you know, meeting any people in public in broad daylight. Like, I just don't see that as ever being the most likely explanation. So... I, I, like, I'm not saying that, like, any of these, like, like earthly explanations where you just sort of ad hoc come up with something that, like, you know, crazy explanations, you're right. Like, I don't have an explanation. I'm not saying I, I can explain every UFO sighting, but the, they are UFO sightings. Right. They're unidentified. They technically do exist. Unidentified doesn't make them aliens. Yes. yes. Oh, and, yeah, and, and I'm not saying it does either. Uh, I will say... Uh, so, like, I think also skeptics have had a tendency, myself included, I suppose, when I was younger, uh, to make up, without quite realizing it, things that are almost iron laws of low alien probability. You know, so they used to say things like, it's very implausible aliens would, tr would go across many, many light years to get here and then just buzz a farm and, and go away. That well, seems I mean implausible. But actually... If, if they do the sort of things we do, like send out cheap, unmanned probes, maybe that's not so implausible. Maybe, right. the, maybe the last thing they would do is send a diplomatic delegation or declare war against some insect-like petty species. Uh, but, you know, they might send out some cheap probes. Maybe we have been cheaply probed. Uh, for, for decades. I'm just saying, so cheap. This is all assuming creatures from from far, far away from some completely different culture would have anything close to a rash, uh, uh, a reasoning like ours. Like we can't. If something's truly alien, then then I don't believe aliens exist. But if something truly was alien, we have we would probably have no yardstick by which to measure their intentions or the way that they reason things. Um, especially if they had sensory capabilities we, we didn't have, like they could see the electromagnetic spectrum or something. There's no way we could know what their reasoning would be. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, tangent. <laughs> no, that was good. That was not a tangent. Oh, yeah. That was oh, directly one, related to the alien discussion at hand. One so, last example, if I could, of, the, uh, of, of how the temptation to create a simpler narrative uh, might lead us to hastily latch on to one. Uh, I, I was starting to say that in the past decade, uh, these hovering triangles have been more commonly reported than the old flying saucers. Um, so, 
an obvious tempting explanation there is, oh, people are seeing uh, stealth aircraft, which tend to be, like, big and black and trash. Right. Um, except even though that seems like an obvious correlation, if you start digging into it, the triangle sightings were occurring at least as early as the 1960s when we didn't have the black uh, triangular military craft we have now. And it looks like there are some sightings that sound almost exactly the same all the way back to the 30s, uh, which doesn't prove there are aliens, but it is a reminder that like the... Uh, the first, ex the first normal mundane explanation you think of uh, may not cover all cases either. Um, and by the way, uh, even though I have not, I have not turned so against my skeptical roots. Oh, and, and and by the way, methodologically, I would say I'm still a skeptic, regardless of whether there turns out to be a Bigfoot or a ghost or whatever. I would still, I would still be skeptical. I would just, you know, say, oh, there's new data. But anyway, I, I, I have not turned, I have not turned so unskeptical as to even canvas my Facebook friends about whether they have uh, any paranormal beliefs or have seen UFOs. However, at parties uh, and a few political <laughs> gatherings, I have, I have you know, chatted about how this topic's a little more complicated than I thought it was with a few small groups of people. So maybe I've asked like 30 people whether they think there's anything to it. And I now know that although, as far as I know, I have never met anyone who saw a flying saucer, I've got five acquaintances out of that tiny sample alone who say they have seen the massive hovering silent triangles, which inclines me to think that while they may not be aliens, they exist, which is itself a little odd and unsettling. And at, and at least three of these people are fairly well-known political writers, so I won't name because they might be embarrassed. <laughs> but, you know, nice. I won't met them. And they weren't, and they were not all of the same political faction or smoking the same substances or anything. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's that's interesting, which which you mentioned about the way the, the black triangles sort of look like uh, are sort of stealth aircraft, and but that the, there's sightings that go back to the 30s because before, like you know, the 30s and the in the 18th century, we had the, the great airship craze. Right, so I was say, 19th yeah. century. Which kind of was like, are we seeing are we seeing sort of secret technology or is this just the human mind sort of projecting these sort of ideas we have onto things right, I mean, we When was the last time we saw like a mysterious airship? It was probably like 19, 1893 or something. So that certainly suggests... <laughs> well, I mean, well, well, we are, I, there's something out there that we're just put, putting this on, on there or are we just sort of seeing something in the sky and, and the time airship was... You know, the, the thing that we had was sort of the closest idea we had to what we, we saw. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand. I, I, actually, I think the, uh, the airships are, are a fascinating example of how uh, some of this stuff gets a little Rashomon or at least X-Files-like in that you could imagine reasonable people uh, latching on to like three totally opposed uh, explanations. So, for instance... I'm sure many UFO believers today would say, ah, the airships were described as these big cigar-shaped objects. That must have been early visitations by the, uh, you know, cigar-shaped UFOs people sometimes say they see. Um, on, the, on the other hand, um, there were a lot of blimps, uh, uh, or essentially early proto-blimps proto and, and balloons that people were excited about in the 19th century. The French were starting to build hot oh, yeah, air yeah. balloons. So people may have, may have just been imagining or making up stories uh, about things like that, especially given the yellow journalism of the day, which widely reported in 1897 a huge wave of cigar-shaped objects, but may have all been BSing. Um, in the 19th like, century newspapers, I mean, I almost, yeah. like, if it wasn't in a newspaper, I'm going to trust it more. That's right. how little I trust those well, newspapers yeah. in that era. Interestingly, 1897 uh, was just a few years before the official uh, unveiling of the first real Zeppelin. Is it possible people were simply seeing uh, prototype unannounced Zeppelin tests. I don't know. I'm not going to latch onto that and say that's what was going on. But that would be an, an interesting example of how, even without aliens, there might be something of historical interest going on there. If there were blimps flying around doing test flights in 1897 without people knowing about it, uh, you know, something that we might someday find documentation on uh, stowed away in someone's back room, uh, that in itself would be sort of interesting. Oh, and one more note. Uh, since I always used to think, like, okay, 
the similarities between these claims and the stuff going on in pop culture is just too coincidental, so I think it's people's imaginations. In other words... Right, in, the entire in the 19- Cold War type... Right, right. In, in the 1940s, you see bit. flying saucers, and then when X-Files shows some flying triangles, they start seeing flying triangles. It seems like maybe people are just reacting to what's in the uh, zeitgeist. Um, and one thing that might be seen as fodder for that, uh, uh, for that theory is that the, if you look closely, a lot of the airship claims of the late 19th century, uh, those people, the people seeing those things did not tend to say, I think it's extraterrestrials. In fact, they would often say things like, I think it's the French, or <laughs> I, I, I think it's... Might as well be aliens. Well, I'll say, like, I think I heard voices. I think I heard voices, and it sounded like it could have been mechanics and engineers working on the thing, and I think there was kind of a basket hanging under it, so it might be a blimp. And only gradually... <laughs> Did those sorts of reports seem to turn into the more blatantly extraterrestrial claims about uh, ghost rockets over the Scandinavian countries in the 1940s and flying saucers that were more blatantly extraterrestrial? So it almost seems like there was a sort of steampunk period in UFO claims where it was all about like eccentric foreign scientists. (laughs) Uh, But again, that could be misinterpretation of a real phenomenon or it could be imagination. Uh, in any case, it would make for some good sci-fi stories. Indeed it did. Um, Dan, I know that we were on the uh, the paranoia chat we had in the summer, um, and that kind of delved into like a, a good discussion of why paranoia can be really bad for the world and isn't just like finding Alex Jones amusing when he's complaining about Justin Bieber. <laughs> Would, like, but would you agree, though, like, the, the alien thing doesn't have as much, obviously, as much real-world application, and therefore, kind of, the bullshit aspect doesn't cause as much harm, except maybe to the History Channel? Or, yeah. like, is, is it harmful because it's still, like, not being rigorous and evidence-based about things? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, how harmful are UFO claims? I mean, I, I you know... Oh, I'm a real killjoy skeptic type, and but I I can't really imagine like what the nexus between believing that there are UFOs probing people are and and actual harm in the real world. But I mean, you can almost never imagine like I mean, part of the problem with just uncritically accepting these types of you know claims that have no connection to reality. I mean, one problem is you can never really predict like what the harm might be as a result of that. So, like, like the belief that, like, mercury preserv- a, a preservative that contains mercury in vaccines causes autism. Mm-hmm. This was a claim that was made in 1998 and has been completely refuted since then. Um, but as a result, a lot of parents of autistic children believe that heavy metal toxicity is the result of, and never mind the stuff about, like, not vaccinating is, like, dangerous, but, like, people who believe that Mercury was responsible, um, ended up giving their kids chelation therapy, which is a, a treatment for heavy metal poisoning, uh, which binds metal in the blood and then you filter it out, which is extremely dangerous. And kids have died as a result of this, this theory that, you know, mercury was causing autism. There's right. no evidence for that. Um, and, and so just as a result of being unmoored from reality, you, you couldn't really predict where that was going to lead, but then, you know, it ends up with kids in the ER because their parents were getting, you know, quacks to, you know, give them chelation therapy. So I, I don't know of any instances of, like, people trying to cut, I mean, you know, alien probes um, out of their body. But, like, I, I mean... Yeah, <laughs> it, it's hard to... It's just you can't predict where a, an irrational belief might take you. Um, I don't think that aliens are a really, really big deal. I would... I would write about them a lot more if I thought that belief in aliens was like causing huge problems. But right. I really think that like anti-vaccine propaganda is more concerning. Well, it's I much mean, more <laughs> earthbound. I mean, yeah. by definition, it's it's if hard to be. Harm, if there's any harm associated with with a belief in aliens or UFOs or something, it would be on the behalf of the state um, investigating and trying to prepare for the eventuality of aliens showing up with less than, than friendly intentions. But, but uh, you know, I mean, what doesn't encourage paranoia on behalf of, of the state, right? I mean, <laughs> right. If, I think if Bigfoot was a little bit more credible, we would probably have, like, automated turrets in the forest looking. <laughs> paranoia, paranoia about, you know, communists 
you know, people who see communists everywhere are, you know, we're much more of a threat to our society than people who saw aliens everywhere. I, so, I will say, though, uh, uh, that uh, there is something to be said for avoiding uh, baseless fear, even if it has no other consequences besides the fear. I mean, especially for kids. I mean, if you're eight years old and you have to spend every night frightened of ghosts, that's a real cost, and I don't mean to dismiss that. If there are children out there who are now afraid they're going to be uh, abducted and probed, and in fact there's no good evidence for any sort of odd things in the sky, uh, that is uh, a tragic uh, net loss. Oh, and I should say I, I have never heard anything remotely convincing along the lines of an abduction story or, or anything like that. And, and in general would be very skeptical of any story that starts out in the middle of the night. I woke up and something really bizarre happened. Then I went back to sleep like it never happened almost. I think Todd's, uh, Todd does make a good point about how fear, you know, fear is, irrational fear is always a cost and that we shouldn't discount it, but you know, I believe that the history of alien mythology and alien visitation, I believe that it started out as aliens were these benevolent people coming to save us from ourselves, from our, you know, our warmongering and our nuclear weapons, and, and you know, they started out as these benevolent forces who were, who were coming to Earth to show us a better way to live. You know, sort of messianic figures coming down. It started from, when, though? I mean, because the earliest in the concrete. Uh, I mean, War of the Worlds is the late 19th century. I don't really... If we're talking aliens the way we understand them... Right, right, now, right. Like... But War of the Worlds was a work of fiction. I mean, people who actually <laughs> you know, thought was there it? were aliens coming, um, and they were, they were giving us revelations about, about, you know, how to live a better life. I mean, I, I, I do I mean, think what? that... I don't want to... I'm not trying to be pedantic, but like, do you mean aliens as we would kind of understand them now, or like vaguely spiritual higher beings type things? I mean, you can probably. Well, I think that it's kind of hard to tell the difference. Like, at some point, you know, a sufficiently advanced intelligence is indistinguishable from God. Yeah. You know? Magic. And the current conception of uh, of like alien invaders kind of evolved gradually over time, so it's hard to pinpoint. Like the first time someone claimed to have seen an alien. If if you if you go back, I mean, because if you go back far enough, you've got sky gods and you know gremlins and things. And then if you get to like the 18th or 19th century, you start to get stories about like uh, sky vehicles coming down and odd people who still seem human coming out and discoursing about their weird homelands. But it's not blatantly <laughs> Martian. So the whole idea kind like of men in black. Over time. I love men in black who are always supposed to look human, but like they're not wearing their human suit very well. Um, exactly. Mothman prophecies is all about that. Just like the like, they're humans, but they they like they got an uncanny valley vibe, and like they think pens are really funny, and like they're just not quite right. Uh, sorry, I like Men in Black. They're fun. Oh, uh, in, in much the same way that I learned some interesting real things about the CIA uh, from looking into this bizarre topic, and some interesting things about Zeppelins. Um, I, I did learn something from Bigfoot, I suppose. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any evidence there's a Bigfoot, but. Uh, as with so many other things in life, uh, the believers were trying to come up with some plausible explanations and theories for how this thing got in the Pacific Northwest, and that's how I learned that it appears there really was, as recently as about 500,000 years ago, a giant eight-foot-tall orangutan living in Eastern Asia uh, called Gigantopithecus blackie. Uh, so one of the theories was that either some of the Gigantopithecus might have like made it across the land bridge right, right. in the woods, or, and this is the really creepy theory, maybe it interbred with humans, because orangutans are known to be attracted to, and even in, on occasion, to sexually assault human females. So, you know, then the theory was, my gosh, Bigfoot is a half orangutan uh, living in the woods. Probably, you know, totally false, but uh, but I learned about the, uh, the orangutans. It's good to learn these things, I exactly. feel like. I think only, like, a CIA, a weird Yale CIA guy would read that, like, half orangutan <laughs> person in the woods. Yes, that sounds really good. Like, that's the kind of weirdness that you only get in the CIA. Like... <laughs> Okay, um, here's the point where this is this is no longer like a, a legitimate segue, but like I'm gonna tell you guys about how much I love 14 Times Magazine because it's not that 14 Times Magazine is remotely skeptical, skeptically minded, but it has like the, their articles tend to have this presentation of sort of like 
this is what some people said, and occasionally just for, like, weird folklore shit that's obviously supposed to be, like, this is, you know, folklore. But they're just... There's something about their relaxed attitude that doesn't have, like, the frantic Alex Jones or the frantic, you know, bright yellow type on a black background type thing where it's, like, I almost believe them more because they're kind of like, oh, this is... This is, this is, like, fun, and this is sort of, you know, in its place. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know, like, like skepticism is good, but, like, I want, I want to be able to appreciate 14 Times Magazine well, without feeling like I'm, like, causing harm to the entire world with my, I don't know. And I, actually, I think 14 Times does come close, in a way, to agnosticism, which has its uses. And by right. that, by that, I don't mean the like strict definition of agnosticism where you say, oh, we just can't know about these things. I think that's an unproductive attitude. Uh, but, uh, you know, both skeptic, some skeptics and many, well, most, or maybe all religious believers uh, would do well to get more comfortable with uncertainty. Um, so if you're dealing with some complex phenomenon and you admit you don't have all the data, you know, it might be okay to say, I don't know, maybe we need some more investigation. And the 40 in times attitude at its best uh, approximates that. Uh, whereas, you know, some some jerk skeptics, I mean, from the skeptical movement, can get in the habit of just thinking of, like, there's a checklist of stuff that doesn't exist that's totally insane nonsense, and there's a checklist of stuff that does exist, and that's all been shown in a lab, and I don't really want to hear about in-between cases because it makes me uncomfortable. I mean, you have to, like, in, be able to, in, I don't know, like, I, I, like, atheist boyfriend is a, he has a bit of the Bless him, like the ad. No, no, no offense to him. Uh, the attitude of like we can't talk about aliens, you know, sort of because of the probability of their existence is so low that it's just you can't you can't talk about that. And like I don't, I I always sort of think of it as an idea of like you're you're having a, a conversation on a couple of different levels, and this podcast is like a haphazard mixture of both of them, which is why it's ridiculous. But I mean, you know, like there's the type of alien conversation I have with my friend in like the middle of the South in his pickup truck in the nighttime, like, do you believe in aliens? Well, I don't know, maybe, like, and then there's the, you know, like, it's not that it's not fun to be scientifically accurate or realistic, but I don't know that you need to talk about you know, in uh, these, you know, mythical or, 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 like, less than real, as we understand it for the moment type things, always in terms of, like, the most highest standard of proof and stuff. But, Dan, you know, I always go back to Dan Beer is not wrong that, like, cred credulous people cause some serious harm in the world. And that is true, and it's ruining my fun when I try to talk about space aliens. <laughs> Because part of it's fun. I mean, just like any other mythology, you know, part of it's just fun just because of what's built up around it, you know. I mean, there's so much. There's so many different types of aliens, you know. Bob Sign. Dylan aliens. Bob Dylan aliens. Signs aliens, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I, like, I like thinking about, like, what would, what is the most plausible kind of alien life form that might try to contact us? Because it's probably not going to be little green men that look just like us, but green with all this stuff on their head. Um, but uh, I mean, before too long, we're due for Vulcans, so I'm going with Vulcans. That would be good. I mean, that there, there's uh, there's nothing to fear if Vulcans come to hang out with us. Vulcans cool. are the best species, hands down. Don't don't bet against the cheap robotic probes. <laughs> yeah, there's some. One of the most distressing, in like a really fun way, things that I've thought about in reference to aliens recently is when Stephen Hawking, I believe, was like, "Guys, do we want to wantonly send like you know radio signals and basically things that say here we are and we're intelligent enough to send the signal out into the universe?" Like, and like the the implication from like the smart dude that like maybe we should reconsider. Um, you know, just alerting the universe to our presence, that gave me the most awesome and alarming sci-fi chill down the spine. Because what if they're not nice, you know? But not even in a plumbing sense, what if they're just, <laughs> what if they're just destroyer aliens? I mean, that's very likely. And we're not opinion. ready for them. I mean, fundamentally, we're totally not ready for aliens. I'm not ready. No. I, I'm, um, I mean, I, I think... I think AI is the most plausible kind of alien. Like, so a, a rogue... A robotic, intelligent, self-replicating, self-improving kind of robot that just like spawns more of itself. But not like, Gort. 
that 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 seems to me the most plausible. Like not something. So like, what it's you're saying? Easy to die. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Yes. Maybe. <laughs> yes, <our space. laughs> All right. So, how afraid of aliens or other creatures were you guys as children, and how afraid are you right now? I will I tell you guys. Very, very, <laughs> very afraid of aliens as a small child, but I was not afraid of like the oh my god they're gonna abduct me or probe me or whatever. It was the thought that like aliens could be around, like just watching my every move, and I wouldn't know. And so like the government is really a, a bigger threat to me right now. <laughs> 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 it's true. Fire in the progression. Watch fire. Oh, Fire in the Sky. That scared Dude, me. As a I'm too movie. scared to watch that movie to this day. Is then, it, what? When, when, you're, when you're a kid, it's so frightening, and then you read up a little bit, and you're like, oh my god, Travis Walton is so full of shit. It will not <laughs> they just made it up. Wow. Yeah. So they're all perks to adulthood. The movie uh, Meg is uh, Fire in the Sky, I think it's called. Yeah, I've Travis never... Walton's story. It's good. It's really like the abduction scenes or the flashbacks are really right. like super creepy. I like, know many adult men who were telling me how scary the abduction scene in that movie is. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's a lot. But I'll take out. it. <laughs> I remember being pretty creeped out after watching Signs because I was sleeping in an attic with like these dark corners that just kind of went down. And I, I kept imagining that they were climbing out, and I had Here's dreams. Here's the that thing. I sort of Here's the thing about signs. No, but Dan, one, the how old were you? Fucking terrible. Two. No. Water. <laughs> water, <laughs> right? The water. The water. The water. The water. water. Really? Dan, did you watch Signs when you were like when it came out, which would have made you what, like thirteen? Really old. Come out. Does anybody remember? What, what was that? When did Signs come out? 96, I believe. Uh, no. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, I, mean, I was, I was, was, okay, I was I 50 years old, and it was scary. The, the whole point of it being really embarrassing that I found Signs so scary was that I saw it in theaters, and I was 15, which is kind of old. Okay. Lucy, yeah, Lucy, that is, that is embarrassing. You should be embarrassed. Well, I, I wasn't scared by the movie. I, didn't, I wasn't scared at the movie. I was scared later at night because I was dreaming and I imagined that aliens were crawling up the walls to get me. Okay, the uh, atmosphere in that movie is fantastic. Like, just ignore the ending if you must, but the atmosphere, the, the building atmosphere is so awesome, and now I love that movie. So, oh, like, the movie years. was really good, other than <laughs> the horrible part. But then he realized, like, these aliens came all the way to Earth. 2002. To us. Came out in 2000. Yeah. And they're allergic to water, or whatever. Spoiler, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, really? Maybe like, it's those aliens are dumb. What if it's something... It's pretty stupid. Maybe it's a baby chemical in the water. Two-thirds of right. the water. <sighs> it was so good. It was what if so it's, like, minerals and shit and in, in the water? Water. Or yeah, it could be. I think you like discovered a night's nice big twist for that movie. That's like he's just been waiting years for someone to figure that out. The whole like oh, aliens are allergic to Earth thing is just like the easiest cop out of like we can't figure out how to get rid of these aliens. Like this is like the War of the World shit. Well, they just at, all least, at least Wells was the first to do it, as far as I know. Right. I mean, yeah, and that was it was good once because that was cool, and then everyone else. I had like, colonization sort of. I mean, he was in the anti-imperialist league. There was some obvious, like, look what yeah. we've done, look what could be done to us type things, which, you know. I have an idea for a good uh, Twilight Zone episode twist ending uh, with aliens, which would basically be uh, if we believe the idea that uh, AI is the most likely sort of alien contact, uh, have them finally reveal themselves uh, to the Earth, not because they feel humans uh, are ready to embrace them, but because... Uh, we develop artificial intelligence, uh, and they're just here to talk to our computers, and now we're totally irrelevant. That's, oh, that's <laughs> good. Oh, we that's really shared good. that. That's, that's good. That's I like good. it. No, I like it. We need to work on this. this is good <laughs> and, and the reason, perhaps, for the flying saucer uptick around World War II wasn't because we developed nukes or rocketry or because we were likely to destroy ourselves. It's because we started building computers. Oh, oh, nice. Dude, can we... 
All right, I'm gonna put my I'm gonna put my dramatic arts training to use and write this screenplay. Stealing it from you guys. <laughs> Hope you don't believe in IP. That's right, we do. <laughs> Sorry, Todd. Uh, actually, I kind of do believe in IP, but I guess. Nope. Kind of <laughs> oh, copyright. It's uh, just aliens <laughs> and IP. That's two strikes. That's yeah, a idea. It's true. He's kicked out of the fold. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah, I was really traumatized by The Blob when I was nine, which is ridiculous now. Um, but, oh, I was, yeah. but I was also much more traumatized by Mars Attacks, which obviously <laughs> is a pure homage to movies like The Blob. Um, oh. So, But I'm working. I'm trying oh. to recover from my, from my childhood oh, well, alien Mark trauma. Well, talking about traumatizing aliens movies, you know, we have to bring up... Indiana Jones in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> oh my god. You know, I, I never watched that. I'm so angry about that movie. Y'all do it. The Star Wars prequel of... Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, Indiana Jones and Aliens would have been fine if they hadn't Whoa, been wrong. terrible in other ways. Yeah. <laughs> Which reminds me that now Chris Pratt is slated to play Indiana Jones and in like that I oppose. And what? Is that confirmed? Is I, that like... feel, I think it's confirmed. And I, I feel oh, very... God. I feel like this is just a continuation of the Crystal Skull. It's... Yeah, I, I, I actually... Like, why aren't they making that Indiana Jones? Aliens and Indiana Jones could have worked, maybe, but it was it just have. like... And also the weird Crystal Skull crap... Like, it was so poorly done, and also, like, only weirdos like Dan Aykroyd. Know yeah. About. yeah. Dan Aykroyd is such they a weirdo. They raped Indy. They raped oh. <laughs> does, does everybody here know who Senator Mike Lee is from Utah? Yeah, Doesn't isn't he, he kind of libertarian? Of Dan Aykroyd? Because <laughs> in Tommy Boy, he's the, the sleazy car salesman. This is totally not oh, yeah. <laughs> But I, 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 I can't get it politics. You can blue hate politics, because... <laughs> Because I plan it less and less. Who, who knows what it's about? <laughs> it's about aliens and our love for them. Do you guys want aliens to exist? This is a much a, another less rigorous question. Yes. Hells, yeah. Because I would have said no when I was little, or even when I was like like a couple years I, ago. I would have never said no. <laughs> because the whole concept that humans are the only life intelligent, like this kind of intelligent life in the universe is really fucking depressing. So, I it, think just, it, was it just is. Because the universe is very, very, very large. True. <laughs> I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said there are two possibilities. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. And both prospects are terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. Love it. Yes. Love it, Arthur C. Clarke. It's good. <laughs> That's pretty much sums it up. I would yeah. Say. I didn't really want aliens to exist until um, I read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> and then I was really depressed that, like, you know, at just just the unlikeliness of me being taken on, like, an alien adventure. Do, like, you, at least, do, you, at least, like, do you at least have a towel ready at all times? Like, yeah, I do. Okay, okay. Good. I still haven't read that. I know that's terrible. What? Oh, you what? need to read it. It's I great. know. I know. Yeah. I mean, I'm we're, we're getting into aliens who used to have existed. Not acceptable. So, like, I want to discover like some ancient ruined alien civilizations where they've all died off, and we can like find their technology and stuff, and like dig it up. Like that would be cool. That would be but like so getting cool. murdered and having our species <laughs> wiped out by a superior intelligence. Is, right. Like, that's kind of a downer. Gets kind so, of yeah. I feel yeah. like we're not gonna get murdered. Like that's probably really, really optimistic. But <laughs> we're getting murdered. As, as a libertarian well, elitist, I like to imagine that if there is more intelligent life out there, um, they're not gonna murder us because they're also out. libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if, like, if the aliens came and they're like the libertarians? All right. All you other people can go fuck themselves, but the Russians, you're cool with that. Science fiction always had like aliens that were that were communists because they're like any society smart enough to go to space is going to be be communist, right? Because it's just the next thing. I think they show up and they're like, "Hey, this libertarian thing is the right." Like, what do you have to trade? We're mostly interested in trade with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Carl yeah, Sagan would have been so disappointed. 
according to the Wachowskis this weekend, when the aliens get here, we'll find out that Mila Kunis is a superhuman alien space princess. And that's probably true. I and mean, she'll overthrow the whole solar really system. attractive. Uh, aristocracy. So there's that to look forward to this weekend, uh, although I've heard the movie is very bad. Oh, wait, what is this movie? Uh, <laughs> Jupiter Ascending. I'm really glad I live under a rock right now. I don't think it's aiming for realism, though. No. <laughs> realism is okay. usually overrated. So here are a couple of important questions. They're not really that important, but they're important to me. <laughs> Please proceed. One, best alien movie? Alien. Uh, okay. Alien. Was easy. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of ones I love. My, uh, the most... I have many ones that are hard to defend my love of. <laughs> I know, I thought, maybe it's just the Body Snatchers, which is sort of yeah. not typical because it doesn't have, you know, saucers and stuff, but I just love it so hard. Oh, the original. Oh, yeah. I, the I book's like the, actually pretty good, too. I like the book a lot. I like the... I remember the, the 70s remake really creeped me out. I like the 70s one, but the 50s one is just, like, I love it. It's just so perfect. And the woman's yeah. moderately competent, which is all I ask in a 50s movie. Yeah. <laughs> moderately competent. Oh, well, even in the book she is, I think, right? But they... Did they never run out of it for the movie? I don't remember. There was one of the videos. Yeah. Wow. I, I was at a house in Providence once, uh, back right after I graduated from college, um, and I was with some friends on a second-floor deck, and... Uh, what's his name, Kevin McCarthy, who starred in mm -hmm. the original yeah. of Body Snatchers, walked by, walking his dog, but I couldn't remember his name because it's so generic. In fact, I just had to remember it now. So I started pointing. Said, that's not just some random guy. That's, that's, what's his name from Invasion of the Body Snatchers? And all my friends are looking at him and going like, what? Like, some random guy walking by. You mean James Coburn? I've been there, Todd. So it was, like I, it was like I was living a scene from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. He's not one of us. And then it was, I actually decided, that since so I couldn't remember up. his name, I would just shout and I said, hey, isn't that a famous character actor? And he turned and waved to me, and nobody saw it except me. And then he went in the corner of the house. And I said, he waved. He's, it was him. And everybody was like, uh, I probably just heard you yelling. And, you know, so he waved to be friendly. But I'm telling you, he responded because I said famous character actor. Oh, well. That's and awesome. I'm, That's yeah. a great story. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why it's so funny, but I really <laughs> Best story I've ever heard. <laughs> I'm now not sure if I'm laughing at the story or if I'm laughing at Lucy laughing. It's really funny. I don't know why. That's a great story. Oh, Meg, to answer your question, um, I really like Mars Attacks, but I also like this movie called Invaders from Mars. There was, I think it was made in the 50s, but it was like the aliens, like they like drug people, but it makes them drunk. It's Wait, isn't that Invasion funny. of the Saucer Man? Is that Invasion the titles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that movie's awesome. And it's really I weird have... to watch that after you've already seen Mars Attacks and you're like, oh, yeah. with the big brains and stuff. That movie's great. It's so funny yeah. and weird. Great. I'd have to say my favorite movie about an alien intelligence whose motivations we'll never understand uh, is probably Oliver Stone's W. <laughs> I've never seen that. <laughs> if I'd known there was aliens involved, uh, the, the twist at the end, I definitely would have taken a look. There were reptilians involved, for sure. Well, <laughs> that's probably true. I am really, really partial to Independence Day. Oh my god, it's such oh a god. bad classic. I, Damn, uh, come on. I saw, when I saw Independence Day in the theater, I was like, like 12 when it came out, but at the Bill Pullman speech, people actually stood up and clapped. <laughs> they should, I, they should. I wish I'd been there. Me too. Because I had that and this is moment because I, I was really excited to see because Bill Pullman in Independence Day is the very best American president. He's <laughs> my president. I mean, yeah. yeah my like if, if I have to, if I have to choose a president, I'm I'm definitely going with Bill Pullman. Yeah, okay. no doubt. Bob Morgan Day. We yeah. celebrate our Independence Day. It's so good. It's just so <laughs> stirring. <laughs> Um, I, I, I like, I like <laughs> to strippers because it's just... Dan's living up to his nickname right now. I, I came to an important, kill nickname. I came to an important realization uh, just in the last 24 hours uh, about aliens and racism, uh, which is that uh, on the Star Trek TV shows, they eventually realize they, they eventually revealed that the reason the Klingons went through a period of not having lumpy heads 
was because they had been injected with DNA from Khan, Khan Noonien Sin. And of course, Khan Noonien Sin was supposed to be Indian, even though he was played by Ricardo Montalban. So yes, <laughs> the classic Khan lumpy Klingons something. were Indian. Figure that out. Retroactively. That's, yeah. That's a whole ah. There are a lot of issues right. there with Star Trek. There, there are so many issues with Star Trek. <laughs> you like, know, Captain Picard is my captain when it comes down to it, because that's what I grew up on. Like, he's, I'd follow him. I would, I would not follow William Shatner into space. I'm sorry. Oh fuck no, no. I, I watched <laughs> Patrick Stewart though. Hell yeah. Oh. yeah. He's so soothing with his I gravitas. I can't even. I can't William watch Shatner knew where all the bars and all the girls in Golden Bay bikinis were, and that's true. Yeah, that's my, you know, that's my jam. <laughs> Although I do appreciate Captain Janeway. I like Captain. That woman has balls. I don't know if I'm ready for a lady captain. I don't think. No, I'm just kidding. I just never watched that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're ready for that. Oh, uh, by the way, it occurs to me that uh, although uh, Mila Kunis may not herself believe in aliens like the ones she'll be fighting this weekend, her co star, Laura Prepon, uh, from that scientologist show is a Scientologist. Mm. Yeah, it, Hollywood is ramp, it's rampant oh, there. Weird. Speaking of weirdo hotties, there's um. Oh my god, what's her name? Symmetrical <laughs> face transformers babe. Oh. Megan uh, <laughs> Fox. Uh, yeah, Megan oh, Fox. Yeah. There's that legendarily <laughs> awful Esquire um interview with her where instead of like indulging all the weird shit she was apparently saying and like copying it down and being like this is weird, this hottie believes weird things. They literally were just like, oh, she said some weird stuff, and then I stared at how symmetrical her face was. And then, like, I wrote a poem about the symmetry of her face. <laughs> it was just like a wasted interview in Esquire. It's like the epitome of why Esquire is terrible. Now it I can never write it. Like they got it right. I just, I don't get Megan Fox. I just don't get it. Her face is very symmetrical, and she believes weird things. That's all you need to know. Okay. Oh, um, Aliens movie. Like, uh, Dan? The Tom Cruise movie recently, I forget what it's called, but it was entertaining, and it had aliens in it, and time travel. Was that the time, the, the repeating time one? It was. Aliens. Yeah, it's like Groundhog Day, but with aliens. It wasn't bad. I like What? It. Tried to watch it, um, could, my, kept buffering, so we had to keep watching parts of it over and over again. Like, can't, like not, like, which was very <laughs> ironic, but I didn't get to watch it, so it was kind of annoying. Ooh. Attack the block! That's a good alien. Oh my god, I just watched uh, that. It's great. amazing! Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Fantastic. Oh my god, it was about so many things. Class and race and aliens and judging people. Attack the block. Oh my god, it was so good. You know, on, on the uh, briefly noted topic of uh, beautiful actresses who probably shouldn't be asked their views, uh, <laughs> young, I, I think it's kind of amusing that young Amber Heard, uh, who uh, was a self-proclaimed uh, atheist and uh, objectivist, um, and who many people labeled a lesbian when she proudly came out at a GLAAD awards ceremony, um, is this weekend marrying Johnny Depp on his remote private island. So mm. the lesbian is she to blame for the decline of Johnny Depp in later years? The inequality of... I think it's a little too... Yeah, he was declining long before. Maybe she just wants access to an endless supply of scarves and hats. <laughs> I, actually, I would borrow some of those. That's true. It's a good point. And this is, uh, you know, eyeliner. So. Yeah. I mean, like, the, the, both the Tim, the Tim Burton and the Johnny Depp of Ed Wood, I would like to go back to that. But uh, in, in later years, there's been some decline from both of them. Speaking of Ed Wood, I think Plan 9 from Outer Space actually gets a bad rap. I mean, it's awful, but a lot of times people refer to it as the worst movie ever. Nothing there's... that amazing could be that yeah, the there's, there's far worse stuff like Frankenstein oh. Island. Just and I'm with, I'm with Jesse Walker <laughs> also on Glenn or Glenda. Like, that is actually, the movie is officially turns into genius experimental film that's also really entertaining as opposed to being the worst. It, like, evolved into something beautiful and almost enlightened, all things considered. Sort of like Amber Heard's film, Drive Angry 3D. Uh, probably not, though. <laughs> More like That's... Tommy Wiseau's The Room. What was that? Oh, yeah, I've never seen The Room. That's another one on my list. I need to see that. Yeah, I went to an IHS seminar and I watched it four times. <laughs> so <laughs> never again. <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm still pretty scarred from it. So. <laughs> 
There's an award-winning Harold Pinter play called The Room. They should, like, uh, and they did a video production of it with Annie Lennox and uh, Donald Sutherland, I think they should, uh, uh, or Donald Pleasant, sorry. They should do a double feature of those. Be like a Nobel Prize <laughs> and writer. I'd go see it. And, and, and then the, the more recent Room. <laughs> Donald Sutherland just makes me think about how I'm still bitter about the movie adaptation of The Puppet Masters. Um, oh, yeah. That was such a crime against That book Hollywood. is amazing. But... I love that book. Yeah. And, like, the oh. lady is so kick-ass, and then they make a movie in the 90s where she's, like, a scientist but doesn't do anything. And oh, that's actually what I was thinking short. of. Yeah. Uh, it's so wrong. Did you yeah. ever see the um, Mothman Prophecies movie? I, I, it physically gave me a headache. Like, it's something about the soundtrack, so I couldn't sit through it. But I like... It, there's, like, nothing to it, I think, at the end of the day, but I really like... The, again, the atmosphere of the Mothman Prophecy. There's nothing to it. There's it nothing has, to it. But it, it has. What are you saying? <laughs> well, at the end of the day, it's a bit flimsy, let's say, like flimsy? a moth, perhaps. But <laughs> it's but it's still so good though because like it has this horrible like fluorescent light sort of vaguely sickening quality to it in yeah. a really good way, <laughs> which is apparently why you stopped watching it because it yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 think um, I really like his, like, John Keel's explanation for, like, UFOs and weirdness is maybe there's, like, this component to reality that we don't, we'll never be able to understand that's kind of unknowable and weird and, and sort of threatening. Yeah. Which, I mean, when I think unknowable and weird and it's kind of threatening, I, I naturally go straight to Richard Gere, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He is that. Uh, John Keel signed my copy of the Mothman Prophecies, but he signed it to Susie because he was old, and I was like, "All right, fair enough, <laughs> close enough." So, but, but he spelled Mothman it weird too. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Rest in peace, John Keel. <laughs> it's fine. Rest in weirdness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mothman Prophecies scared the ever-loving hell out of me as a child. <laughs> that was like seriously the scariest movie. It's weird. I was traumatized more by trailers for it, but when I finally watched it, it was at 3 p.m. in like a really well lit room, so I was okay. But I remember being I in Salt Lake City with my I sister, like and the trailers were on TV. Experience it. It was just yeah. It was really. There wasn't like there. I think the fact that there wasn't like quite enough substance to the film somehow <laughs> made it creepier to me. Yeah, yeah. I'm like I am a sucker for like, really I had good so atmosphere. Many questions. I had so many questions. Like. It was just very, very creepy. I'm, I'm really like, I'm expecting to like turn around and see some like weird entity in the window behind me at any moment. Yeah, no. Don't be there. Don't do not. Yeah, I still, you know, I, it was only like in the last year that I started watching um, all of the X Files episodes, as opposed to the ones that had nothing to do with either ghosts or aliens, which, as you can imagine, probably limited my choices in viewing a little bit. I watched it when I was little. Like, I remember Sunday nights, you know, you watch The Simpsons, and you watch, like, King of the Hill, and you watch The X-Files, except if the alien component was going to be really overt, then you didn't watch The X-Files, and you had to hide away instead. Um, so I'm glad that I now, at the age of 27, am prepared emotionally to watch The X-Files. <laughs> I haven't watched the X-Files since I was a little kid. I had this practice of, like, so, like, the way our house was set up, I could, my bedroom was upstairs, my parents' bedroom, and, like, the living room, obviously, was downstairs. And I could sneak down, like, the stairs, like, part way and watch whatever my parents were watching. So I would do that, and I would watch, like, the X-Files and, like, whatever else I wasn't supposed to watch. But, like, I don't really remember, like, anything about the X-Files, like, watching it, but I remember being really, really creeped out. Like super, super oh, creeped yeah. out, getting nightmares <laughs> from the X Files, but I would do it anyway. Like just creeped out after I'm supposed to be in the, bed. The X Files for me, <laughs> aliens and alien abduction, all that less scary because it becomes less, less weird and more prosaic. Like, oh, it's yeah. just guys with like black tar coming out of there. You know, like it, it's like, true, yeah. It's it's it does that. Where like, but then you go if you ever see something that that really sort of beggars explanation, like. Uh, that is infinitely more frightening than, than David Coveney and, and shape-shifting alien 
My my favorite like, episode of X Files by far was the one uh, entitled Jose Chung's from Outer Space, where a writer played by Charles Nelson Riley uh, is asking uh, Scully and Mulder uh, and others to recount an apparent uh, alien incursion in a town. That and, episode is amazing. Yeah. And er- and not only is everybody's version different, but it was the first episode where you start to realize, oh. Maybe there actually are gray aliens who we hadn't seen before uh, in the story, and the Air Force is also faking abductions, uh, that, which was quite a combo. Someone po- said that that was, like, the best episode of the show ever, but not the best episode of the X-Files sort of ever, because it's not really a good representation of like what the series is like, but it's just so good that in See, itself I, that, yeah. I would contend it's the one where we figured out what was really going on. Yeah, it's, that's really... I watched that one incessantly. <laughs> well, there's... Yeah. The, the guy who's like the son of the sheriff of the county in New Mexico where all the cattle mutilations happen said, yeah, I know it's totally, it's totally just government experiments or messing around with some weapon system and and then predators do the rest of it. <laughs> that, I, I'll, 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 rest, I'll stick with that explanation because it's most comforting. We didn't even discuss cattle mutilations. I remember reading the Mothman prophecies when I had a fever, which was a terrible idea. And I got to the part about cattle mutilations and I was like... The, the book actually, you know, has UFOs and Men in Black and a lot more than the movie does. When I got to Cal Mulations, I was like, all right, put this aside for now. We're just putting this away. But another example where there, there are multiple explanations and they're all weird uh, is uh, there's a documentary called Mirage Men uh, that's almost entirely about a man uh, who used to work for the government. And it appears, although he could be still lying, that his job was actually to stoke the paranoia of believers in UFOs because the government was interested in seeing whether these people were likely to try sneaking onto military bases. So they or or, or uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and occasionally would rather have those people obsessed with flying saucers than obsessed with real uh, military flights. Um, and eventually he uh, rather famously drove one guy insane and he had like a complete paranoid schizophrenic breakdown and thought he was in contact with aliens. Oh god. That's not good. And and then to add to the weirdness, add to the layers, after this whole like 90 minute documentary about how it was his job as a, a government worker to basically drive people nuts, um, but how there was nothing to the alien claims he was feeding them, at the very end, they ask him, so how did you get into this line of work? And he basically says, well, when I was a young man in the Air Force, they showed us a film of the actual aliens. <laughs> and and so I was fascinated from that point on with the UFO community. Now, most likely he's still lying. That guy's an asshole. It was, uh, <laughs> does it count as giving away the twist ending if it's a documentary? But, uh, it sort was of, very, but... Dis- it was a disturbing moment uh, for the film, anyway. Uh, oh, and by the way, in, in ro- speaking of multiple narratives, uh, I know a guy whose family is from Roswell, and he claims that, like, everybody there knows it's true. Like, like he says he, his father grew up knowing all these old people who said it's true, but the military said they're really going to screw with us if, if, we, if we tell the truth, so everybody just has to keep their mouths shut. By contrast, uh, National Review writer Andrew Stutterford uh, took a trip to Roswell, and he, with equal plausibility, says if you go around and question people, at first they'll say, oh, there's aliens, and there was some wreckage and stuff, and then if you keep pushing them, you realize... They're telling tall tales in exactly the way that people in Salem, Massachusetts do to stir up tourism. Oh, yeah, we saw, like, three saucers, and some of us got abducted, and here's a souvenir. So. See, I love that, because I do... I want to go to Roswell at some point, just because, the obviously, the, the Americana aspect to that story is great. Uh, no Lucy, matter, Lucy, I no feel matter like... What happened, yes. At some point in the future, maybe, like, next summer or something, we should do, like, a road trip. Where we go like, all over the U.S. That sounds oh, that sounds so beautiful. I would love to do that. I want to go look at the scary signs surrounding Area 51 that tell me how I can't trespass. Also, let me just let me just say that Dan Beer says he had to go, but I would like to think that we drove him away with our credulity. Um, we did. Like he, he can't deal with it. He really Going back to Roswell, Roswell real quick, the UFO. Um, the 4th of July weekend at the UFO Festival, which is a whole lot of fun. Willie Nelson used to play there. Uh, That's awesome. Three seasons ago. Uh, but, yeah, we should, totally, we should all totally go to Roswell next summer. That's my UFO. new dream. Oh, my God. Uh, do you see uh, Six Days in Roswell? No. That It's on um, Hulu. I don't know if it's on regular Hulu or if you have to have Hulu Plus. 
but it's about this guy. Um, I can't remember his name, but he's um, from Minnesota, and he wants to be abducted by aliens, I guess. Or Richard Kronfeld. Um, so he goes during the fest during like the fiftieth anniversary, and like, and it's just like he stays in some like some camper that some old guy has, and he has to stay with these like two dogs, I guess. <laughs> I know like, what I'm doing later tonight. Yeah, and he, uh, <laughs> I I didn't watch the whole thing, but you know, but he like talks. Yeah, he, you know, he he interviews all these you know like alien people dressed as aliens, alien, lo alien lovers. There's a musical. They have a little excerpt from it. I don't know if it's still uh, going. I don't know if it'll be there this summer. But uh, uh, I know, uh, I know that Dan Beer is not like like a like a robot, you know, like I obviously I was teasing him with his, him being the killjoy <laughs> of this chat but like fundamentally human human nature like human society and like all of the ridiculous stories that we tell and like this we, what we swear happened in the sky last night like, like the world might be better if people realized like what proof actually means but like it's just so much, bullshit is just so much fun Except when I turn on the History Channel and there's nothing historical on. That actually <laughs> pisses me off sometimes. Since, since Dan's not here, I, I, I feel like you know, I have to put in the skeptical <laughs> you know, and say that uh, you know, science and the real universe are plenty mind-blowing already. <laughs> Shut up, Todd. Um, uh, oh, by the way, if you ever want to have an experience similar to going to Roswell and trying to be abducted, I, I know a guy <laughs> who, uh, uh, once again, should remain nameless because he might be embarrassed, but uh, he... <laughs> David uh, Fromm, isn't it? No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> he went through a period of, oh, of Crystal, believing, got it. He went through a period of believing uh, very much in the aliens, and he drove by or sort of through uh, Area 51. You can get fairly close to it anyway, and you don't see any aliens. But because it is a military facility, uh, he he said if his experience is any indication, if you drive by late at night, you do get followed by big SUVs with sort of CIA looking guys. And when he stopped at one point at a roadside rest stop and went to use the urinal, one of the guys actually like came in and sort of stood next to him watching him the whole time and was and was wearing shades in the whole nine yards and, and uh, uh, so. The, 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 I want to do this so badly. <laughs> I mean, like that's I, I totally yeah, buy that. I'm that. Urinal, but, like I'm I'm good without that. Part. <laughs> <laughs> but I totally buy that that happened because it is a military base and there is covert shit happening. And because if you work there, wouldn't you try to freak people out in exactly that way? Wouldn't you go yeah. like the extra mile and wear oh sunglasses God, necessarily? Yes. My, and maybe act a little weird in case someone thought you might be a man new in black. Life green. New life green. <laughs> That's what I want to do. How do I do this? Um, my, my dad actually knew a guy that worked at Area Without being involved with the government. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> What was that, Seth? Well, my dad knew a guy who worked on Area 51 when they were building it, or one of those installations. Um, and what they had done, it was, it was really interesting the way it was so compartmentalized uh, back in the 70s or whatever. Uh, they would get like the guys an electrician, and they would go and they would work. They they go out on a, on a bus with blacked out windows, and then they would walk. You know, they'd be taken right to the door. They'd work in one building of one room, and if uh, like construction ran long or whatever, they would switch out crews. Mm -hmm. So everyone only saw one building, one room. You could never put together the whole thing, and they couldn't go outside for most of the day because they knew when the Russian satellites were passing over. Yeah. Which is just like fascinating to me. Back in the seventies, they could kind of figure all that out. Some <laughs> so. of that stuff in the book I mentioned that seemed credible until the ridiculous ending, and I think a lot of it probably is credible. She just like lost her goddamn mind at the <laughs> end. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense that that's how you would treat you know your employees at your secret base. Like yeah. that they would yeah, it, it makes sense. So I guess. Um, has it, did, has anything unexplained ever happened to any of you? That's the yeah. other unasked question. I I grew up in a house that was supposed to be haunted. And? Uh, I was too young to experience it. I was a baby, but uh, everyone who lived in that house, uh, quite a few people lived in it, um, had had roughly the same experiences of, of unintelligible voices talking to each other, and you. By the sort of the cadence, you could tell that they were having conversations, or laughing, or arguing, and you could they would respond to like if you yelled at them or shut up, they would be quiet and they'd start whispering. 
Um, I've also seen the Marfa lights, which are incredibly hard to, to explain to yourself. Uh, and what's that? They're, they're lights in a sort of remote part of West Texas out in the desert. It's out in the middle of the desert, and you know, these strange lights that... The closest thing I can describe them is, you know, like a blob inside of, inside of a lava lamp, how it mm -hmm. sort of changes and splits off and does all these different things. Mm -hmm. Imagine something do, uh, like a light doing that in midair out in the desert in front of you. Sounds cool and slightly <laughs> unnerving. Oh, yeah. And there, there are enough phenomena like that, I, I will say. I wouldn't be shocked if someday we find out, you know, we've never been visited by aliens, but that plasma uh, balls that glow float around in the atmosphere much more frequently than we would have imagined. It just seems like there are a lot of stories that involve spheres of light or, you know, the, the Hestelin lights uh, that... Uh, have been photographed passing across a uh, Scandinavian uh, canyon uh, periodically. Uh, I don't know. If, if things like ball lightning may be real, and certainly the northern lights are, I suppose there could be other strange meteorological type phenomena we don't know about. Oh, but I worked in, I worked in a haunted I, I did see a ghost at Arbors. I don't believe in ghosts, oh. but I saw one. So, I have, yeah, that happens. <laughs> I mean, I had a friend who saw ghosts, and he swears he doesn't believe in them, but he saw something. I don't believe in them, but I, there's no other explanation for what, what I saw and what my friends saw. We saw independently of each other and didn't ever speak of it until one day we all, like, hey, have you seen that? It's a long, long, complicated, weird, creepy story, but uh, there's no other way to explain it than, the, like, you know, something beyond science happened. It's something we can't understand scientifically. Well, wait, so I'm curious then, why don't you believe in ghosts if you had that experience? Uh, I, I mean, just sort of ghosts as we understand them, like like some restless spirit or something like that. I, I personally don't. What, what it was was, it was this hardware store that was really old, and um, we would all see this old man in 1930s garb standing, looking very angry, and in, in different parts of the store. Uh, so real enough that we thought he was like a customer waiting for waiting for somebody to go give him like some lumber or some sack of concrete or something. But then though, you know, it's, it's really, really hot in El Paso, so he also think I've just been out in the sun too long. And uh, I've never spoke of it until somebody said, Hey, have you ever seen that old guy? You ever think you see an old guy out in the yard? And we all Yes. <laughs> and then we all started talking about it, and we all realized we had described the exact same person. And that was very odd. And uh, so the owners, this hardware store had been in the family for a long time, the owners uh, went and asked their parents, and they said, well, that sounds exactly like the guy who was beaten to death on this property back in the Oh, God. Year. What the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> I don't believe, like, that, 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 that doesn't make any, any sense. But the, to get even creepier, the, this is, what, 15, 20 years later since I've worked there, um, there's a woman who works there now and has a uh, son who's autistic. And he has uh, kind of, you know, things that go along with that, and, and sometimes he has some trouble with public spaces and things like that. And he goes, he she got he got in there a couple of times and was absolutely frightened. They kept staring at something right behind her. She's a cashier, like right behind where she stands at the, at the register. And he would just kind of shut down. He was over, and uh, they finally got him calmed down and figured out what was going on. And she had no no idea, but no one had ever told her about it. Uh, he said, there's a man wearing farmer clothes standing behind you, and he's very angry. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I can't explain any of that, but I still don't believe in ghosts. So. You built something, though. That's... Hmm. I, I, I would just say that I haven't seen anything scary because for most of my life, I really didn't want to see anything scary. And I... I <laughs> But I think that if I asked my sister what she believes she's seen, I would probably be unable to sleep tonight. <laughs> what was that, Meg? No, I just... I, I am also in the camp of, like, I refuse to see anything scary, therefore I'm not going to see anything scary. And that's mostly true. Mm -hmm. However... <laughs> um, <laughs> uh. So, like, the house that I grew up in, um, like, mostly grew up in from, like, five, I think, or not quite five, like, almost five until I was, like, 12. Um, that whole neighborhood was fucked, basically. Um, the theory <laughs> is that <laughs> it was built on, like, an ancient Indian burial ground or something. Oh, no! Too many weird things happened in that neighborhood. 
like way too many, and this one house in particular, um, something bad happened like before we moved there, and I don't really remember. I think it was like, it was like a couple, and the dude beat his wife to death with a baseball bat, which like that's that's pretty bad, right? right. But then like the next family that moved into that house, um, the teenage son one day just like murdered his parents, like while we were living there, like they just murdered. Oh, God. Yeah, it was it was pretty wow. pretty gruesome. Um, and then I think, let's see, there was a family that lived there after that. Like, these are kind of, like, I was pretty young, so a lot of these memories are really fuzzy. Um, but they had a fire that, like, completely gutted the house, basically. And the whole reason for the fire was, like, really, really weird. This is, these are, like, terrible details that I don't remember. But, like, a lot of weird and bad stuff happened in the house in particular. Yeah. Then, like, an addition onto the neighborhood, like, adding more houses and stuff, the construction crew was, like, complaining about, I'm not kidding, complaining about power tools not plugged up, turning on. And no, no. Off of them. Like, I'm not kidding. I wish I were kidding, but I'm not. <laughs> um, and I and the, do house, that. <laughs> the house that I lived in, um, it was, like, we had, like, a full downstairs and, like, a half upstairs, so it was my bedroom, a very, like, large hallway, and then my dad's office, and so I was, you know, upstairs by myself, and I like to attribute this to a kid's overactive imagination, but I, I kind of can't because of, like, all the other stuff going on, but I would hear footsteps constantly, um, I would hear, like, my music box would just, like, randomly start playing on its own, it was, like, so bad that I was literally... I spent most of my nights sleeping in my parents' room. Oh, like, no. I was terrified all the time. And to make matters worse, my mom would, like, see figures, like, walking around or, like, like peeking through the door or something. And then our neighbor, like, the, the little girl that lived next to me, who we were friends, and then our moms were friends. And then our moms got to talking one day, and they're like, so do you ever, like, do things in your house? Like people in your house, and like, yeah, that kind of happens sometimes. So when you, <laughs> when you said you've seen nothing, you mean you've seen constant uh, ghost <laughs> happening? No. Possessions and, then, and like, basically follow like, you around everywhere. Um, <laughs> but it was mostly that neighborhood. Like, I, I've never really had... I, I, <laughs> this sounds so completely ridiculous, but... One night, um, my mom and I, and this was, like, not terribly long ago. I mean, it was it was probably close to 10 years ago, but I was no longer, like, a little kid. Um, my mom and I were just kind of driving around our hometown talking, and we, we went through the old neighborhood, and we saw... At the same time, because we both kind of, like, looked at each other and, like, wait, did you, did you see that? It was, like, this dog that was, like, in a yard, and then just vanished. Wow. And that sounds, like, crazy and ridiculous, <laughs> and I'm, I'm choosing to chalk it up to, like, a hallucination or something. I don't know. Um, but it, it was weird and, and creepy, and I like to not think about those things, or that, that neighborhood. Like, there was something wrong with that neighborhood. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to that neighborhood. I'll give you <laughs> no, that. I, I would recommend not doing that. It was, there's, there's something wrong there. <laughs> One time, my mom and I thought we were having a hallucination about a raccoon, but it was actually just a real raccoon climbing on our cereal shelves. Um, <laughs> so that's good. You know, I, I stared at it for like five seconds. I was like, Mom. And she literally didn't see it because it was so inexplicable to have a raccoon climbing on the sh cereal shelves. So it's like, I thought I was hallucinating for like a really like palpable ten seconds. I'm like, oh, yeah. Mom, do you see that? <laughs> or it's like I, a raccoon. Yeah. Ghost That's raccoon. my paranormal experience, yeah. a raccoon that was actually there. So. I think my favorite like paranormal story, though, is... Um, so I've, I've always really enjoyed going to Colonial Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this one house... Um, fuck, I can't remember the name of the family now. I'm related to them somehow, though. <laughs> the Peyton Randolph house. I'm related to his wife. Mm-hmm. Somehow. I'm like a descendant or something. I don't remember. Um, but so the Peyton Randolph house is like this really like big brick red house um, in Colonial Williamsburg. 
And uh, for some reason, like, we didn't, like, tour that house until I was older, like, after I was married. <laughs> um, and so I'd always been creeped out by it. I wasn't sure why, but it just, like, gave me really bad vibes. <laughs> And I didn't really know anything about it. Like, I just didn't learn anything about this particular house or that family or whatever. But then um, one of the more recent times I went to Colonial Williamsburg with my family, like, we found out that's, like, the most haunted house haunted house in Colonial Williamsburg. But um, one of the stories that they tell, and, of course, I don't know if this is true or anything, but one of the stories that they tell about that house um, kind of reluctantly um, is that one of the security guards... Uh, it was like a, a, you know, a big dude, very skeptical dude, like doesn't believe in this bullshit, um, went on one of like his nightly rounds or whatever to the house and he was like going down into the basement and something happened and he quit his job. He immediately quit his job and refuses to talk about what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like really, really fucking creepy. And like all of these people died in this house. Like all these terrible things happened. And maybe if he you was go on the tour or whatever it feels colonialism. Like maybe, like maybe. maybe. <laughs> that is that is a legit thing to be tired of colonialism. <laughs> I'm tired of this historical accuracy. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fucking tired of colonialism myself. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. That house is creepy. And, but I really recommend going on, like, ghost tours of Colonial Williamsburg because it's fun. <laughs> oh, you know what? That reminds me of my other banal <laughs> ghost story, like, deep banal, which is that I went to Gettysburg with my friend, and he was telling me many exciting, uh, you know, solid ghost stories about Gettysburg. Solid ghost because... stories? They were well, solid. <laughs> solid. <laughs> but, like... At one, it, it was, like, kind of off-season, so, like, it was great. The battlefield was all empty and stuff. And at some point, I was near Pickett's Charge, and I smelled cigar smoke. I was like, oh, it's got to be a ghost. I smell that. It's, it's happening. And then it was a guy smoking a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> it was really disappointing. I really like that story, though. <laughs> like, I was an actual I man smoking a cigar. <laughs> it was a very solid ghost. <laughs> Uh, I don't have any good stories at all. It's rough. I can't um, believe I just told those ridiculous, like, half-assed stories I, on something that's being recorded. Uh, <laughs> uh, even if it turns out that, uh, you know, none of the uh, paranormal phenomena exist uh, and it's all just psychological, uh, it's interesting in itself how uh, predictable and recurring uh, some of those psychological phenomena must be. Um, yeah. My, my own mother had the sort of classic uh, ghost experience, which both she and I, probably just psychological, um, of uh, waking up in the middle of the night, she thought, perhaps just dreaming, um, and thinking she saw a uh, sort of big white hovering sphere in front of her that looked almost like it was uh, trailing gas out the bottom, almost like uh, if you drew a cartoon of it, it would look like a kid's cartoon of a ghost. Yeah. Um, and uh, it seemed to be, it, it terrified her, but seemed to be communicating, it will be all right, it will be all right. And my mother just remembers saying, what the hell was that? <laughs> a few hours later, her father called and said her mother had died. Oh, shit. Uh, oh, wow. So it's probably just a case of, you know, mom having other nightmares like that that she doesn't remember because they weren't correlated with an important psychological right. experience like that. Um, but uh, she may also have realized her mother was ailing and uh, and sort of, you know, on a subconscious level, been under a lot more stress and thus more likely to have such an experience. And things like that sure do seem to happen a lot. People are under terrible stress when loved ones die, and it's common for them, it appears, to hallucinate the recently deceased loved one very often, which is interesting in itself, even if there isn't an actual paranormal element to it. Uh, okay, oh, so... Actually, I mean, in a similar way, one, one of the creepiest psychology stories ever to happen in human history, perhaps, uh, sort of involves the UFOs. Uh, uh, 21 years ago in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, 60 children came running in from recess at a school, um, and, and they weren't and they, they weren't just like uh, you know children who'd never heard of airplanes or, or something like that. I mean, they, they were fairly uh, well educated and wealthy by the standards of, of the region. Um, uh, and and also uh, ethnically diverse, and there was some diversity in age. Uh, they came running in from recess and said, this uh, hovering disc-like craft just landed outside, and a little man in what looks like a black jumpsuit uh, came out 
and was watching us with huge eyes um, and was surrounded by these other smaller craft. And the kids urged the teachers to come out and look at this thing, huge numbers of the kids, and the teachers all thought it's some game they're playing, ignore it. Uh, and so none of the adults saw, saw this if there was anything there. Uh, but the kids so adamantly stuck to their story uh, that documentarians came within a few days and interviewed the kids, and we now have hours of footage of the kids describing what they saw, and uh, they not only did they stick to their story, but uh, they were re-interviewed 16 years later um, as adults and uh, in 2010, uh, and many of them, of course, you know, if you believed it when you were a kid, you might just repeat it to yourself and believe it all the more when you're an adult. Uh, but they stick to the story uh, 16 years later um, and, uh, and, and, and even express the kinds of doubt and uncertainty you would expect from people who actually had some sort of experience. So like some of them will say, I try not to think about it, but I suppose if there were one day I could revisit to figure out what actually happened, it would be that one. And then there are others who say, I, I know, I think it was aliens, and I hope they come back. I'd be delighted to talk to them. Um, <laughs> and, and then adding to the weirdness, one of the people who interviewed them was a notoriously uh, pushy uh, psychiatrist who believed in alien abductions, uh, who has since passed away, John Mack. So he may have simply nudged the kids unwittingly right. in the direction of the preferred narrative, but it's amazing how effectively he did, i got to say. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all know kids can be... You know, easily manipulated. Satanic kids, sex abuse yeah. scandal always comes but to some mind. Some of the kids terms. were like twelve and and eleven and so forth. They weren't all like you know six year olds. And and you can watch hours of them of them being very articulate with their quasi British sounding accents uh, on YouTube, saying things like, "I have not been influenced by my friends. I know what I saw," and so forth. Uh, it's a little. I, See, I believe this, it. I believe this it. This is from, the from kind of retelling of the story. I believe it. <laughs> This is the kind of thing that Todd sends me at like two in the morning. I'm like, Todd, I'm not gonna watch that because it's two in the morning, and I sleep poorly enough as it is. Um, Todd, and that's... Todd, like as as someone apparently with with Lucy's like sleep issues and like oh. aliens are a bit scary issues. Stop doing this to her. That's okay. very. <laughs> no, I'm doing it. just the daylight, Todd. The daylight. Yeah, yeah I mean, do it, only, do it, but it's only totally Mothman from now on. <laughs> <laughs> I just. I keep going back to, to sort of Mothman, like, like either there's some weird component to reality we just will never be able to completely understand, or we have weird psychological things in our brains that make us see things that aren't, we use fantastic things that aren't there and believe in them. And what possible purpose could that serve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's fun. <laughs> I know, right? That's like that's my really dramatic <laughs> premise to this entire talk. <laughs> I think, I think uh, what, one reason for that tendency to exist, uh, and we've probably all heard this before, is that uh, there's a certain efficiency to spotting patterns. Uh, and, oh, yeah. yeah. And if your brain is anticipating patterns, it may sometimes spot ones that aren't really there. Um, but it's it's worth the risk for your brain to constantly be anticipating and I, and as uh, and actually as Jesse Walker from Reason uh, has written about uh, one of the most common patterns that we instinctively anticipate is seeing minds or beings like our own because those are the most important elements of your environment were the most important elements of our evolutionary environment when we were our brains were forming you need to know if there are other people if there are enemies if there are friends and so you know you see you see a cloud you think it looks like a face you see a shape in the woods you're inclined to think like oh it could be a person it could be a, a, a giant hairy man beast um, it, but like the sudden I, appearance of like you know like what appears to be a creature it's that's not totally logical to me though like it makes yeah. more sense to say okay pat, conspiracy theories okay I, I'm gonna think that's all connected more than it is because that's but uh, like, if you, if you, ultimately, like, ultimately the brain the human brain is a storytelling machine so if you find something and you can't explain it you're going to concoct some story to explain it because that's how your brain works. Yeah. You're also instinctively primed not just to anticipate people and patterns, but also predators. There's a reason that even new, uh, like one-year-old babies know that something with fangs and claws looks like a threat, and they're right. not learning that from the environment. That's instinct. 
And because they were raised by aliens and they have a lingering yeah. memory of the horror yeah. that was inflicted yeah. upon them. That as well, yeah. It's really unfortunate. That's <laughs> like dragons have sometimes been pointed to as an, as an example of something that probably... Uh, didn't exist in history, uh, but it may be instinctive. Uh, it definitely did exist in history. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Max. But, uh, but it, it, makes sen- it makes sense that we would instinctively anticipate that danger looks like some combination of a snake, uh, a big cat, um, and something poisonous. You know, so it, it, uh, it could be that independent groups of human beings uh, instinctively were drawn to those same sort of predator images as something to fear. I, I seem to re- remember reading, I think it was in 14 times, that like Switzerland doesn't have as many UFO sightings as most uh, industrialized nations do, but they have like an off, like an abnormally high record, uh, a record of dragon sightings. <laughs> That's where dragons are from. So um, also, hmm. also Iceland. So I feel that Iceland is the best country in the world because the majority, yes, the majority of their citizens believe that elves exist. Yeah. They, they, I think that's just a beautiful they, thing. They plan around, like, that's, oh, that, that rock belongs yes. to them. They have to build a road is, around it. That is so ridiculous and gorgeous, and they're just a beautiful people. Well, Bjork does exist. <laughs> also, also, <laughs> hey, Bjork is an elf. An independent confirmation of the existence of Bjork. Yonsi <laughs> is also, Yonsi of Zero is also definitely an elf man. Why, why does the view of Lucy's room look scarier now? <laughs> because my computer was dying, and did, I, I thought I could this up, but I also need to charge my computer. And also, <laughs> because... no, also, Lucy Stegerwald is an alien, in case you guys didn't know. I mean, it says so on her lower third, or whatever it the hell it's called. Or no, uh, it's looks, this is a good ending. I should, I, I should have planned it like this, but I didn't. I, my computer was just going to die any second, and that would have been a really auspicious ending just to disappear. our journey together. Um, guys, let me, as much as this is beautiful, um, I should probably wrap this up in an official sense, um, though I, I, we should have ended with, I don't know, Buddy Holly being an alien, or Elvis being an alien, or whichever <laughs> rock stars are secretly aliens. Or um, because he looks like Buddy Holly. He's an alien. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that explains a lot. Um, do we have any final words on space aliens or other important entities? I, I will say the, the two guys that wrote the uh, the book Witness to Roswell uh, claim that on May fifth uh, they will unveil photographs that it sounds like they actually did find in a shoebox from 1947 or thereabouts, uh, owned by a couple of rich, well-connected people, a lawyer and a geophysicist, uh, that they've had uh, dated and authenticated as real Kodak paper stock from back in the day that look for all the world like they're photos of the Roswell aliens being dissected. Oh, uh, I'm so, so ready, Todd. Uh, I'm in my bunker. May yes. 5th, uh, they're going to do a press conference. Lucy, Lucy, like, go ahead, like, schedule a special episode. <laughs> what if they disappear before then? May 5th oh. is a long time away. Like, a lot of... <laughs> why May 5th, actually? Uh, yeah, like, why are know. we waiting this long? Like, to, uh, have them. It's the day after Star Wars Day? I don't know. Uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. Oh, yeah. There we go. Building the hack. Well, you know what? We'll probably need to have a podcast when that auspicious day comes. Let me let me wrap this up officially, because good God. <laughs> um, thanks to Dan Beer, who left, our resident Killjoy, who we love very much. Um, thanks to Meg, and thanks to Seth and Zach, and thanks to Todd Seavey, the catalyst for all of this madness. Um, I will link to all y'all's important websites you know, when I put this up. That's, that's not a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> keep watching the skis, as uh, Leonard yeah. Nimoy said in The Simpsons. Or no, you, you guys. The truth is out there. Yes, it is. It really is. <laughs>